Hi, Rich Folley here, and we're sitting right now with David Giffels, whose book is The Hard Way on Purpose, Essays and Dispatches from the Rust Belt. Welcome, first of all, to PBS at the Miami Book Fair. Thanks a lot for having me. Yeah. I always go to Miami to meet people from the Rust Belt. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. I'm from Detroit. You're from Akron. That's right. Uh, it's good to have two Midwestern people talking. Yeah. Like, it's always, I, I feel at home. Yeah. Yeah. At home, if, actually, there's a lot of Midwesterners down in Miami, too. I know. Um, let's first of all start with something that I read in your book that, that immediately hit home for me as a Detroit person is that the defining characteristic of people who live in the Midwest is basically watching people leave, yeah. and people not stay. Yeah, and people of our generation, you know, like every, ge every generation has its own story of a place and for people, um, you know, of my generation, Generation X, who grew up in a place like Akron, Ohio, that was the story. Your parents said, you get out of high school, you need to get out of here. There's no more opportunity or, you know, there's, there's better opportunity other places. The weather's terrible. The economy's terrible. You know, things are changing. So, um, so for someone who stayed through all of that and saw what it means not to leave at each of those opportunities, there's a story to tell um, that I think isn't told as often because the story of brain drain has been the story. You know, that's what I, when I was a columnist for the Akron Beacon Journal, I was writing about it all the time. But at some point I realized, well, my city has lost a third of its population in, in my lifetime. But two-thirds of us are still here. And what's that story of the people who stay and commit and see it through its hard times? Mm -hmm. that, what made it so interesting, what makes some, some people who, don't, who didn't come from Akron, I, I never came from Akron, is how closely it resembles the stories of so many American Rust Belt cities, whether yeah. it's Pittsburgh or Detroit or, or Cleveland or, <coughs> or Akron. I mean, this story is one, as you read it, you're like, exactly. That's exactly what happened to me. It's, it's an entire region, not just Akron, but Akron's su such an embodiment of that story. Yeah, I mean, it's a very personal book, but I did a ton of research, and my whole instinct was to write very specifically and personally about my experience and my place, always thinking of my counterparts in Buffalo, in Detroit, in Flint, in Pittsburgh, in, Det in, in you know, in Cleveland, even even though we're close by, like how is this projecting the story of a lot of other people? And the thing that's been, I guess, rewarding for me is to have had this conversation with people all over the region mm -hmm. that they sh have shared the same experience. Right. The first story in the book um, talks about LeBron James, another Akron resident right. who uh, went to Cleveland, stayed home basically, then left. But he seems to me, as you see what's happened, because you wrote this before he left. Right before he left uh, Cleveland, I believe. But what's happened to him since seems to be the embodiment of everything, all the theories and themes in your book. Yeah, um, you know, I wrote the essay. He left in 2010, I wrote the essay in 2012, and the book came out in 2014, and he came back. Um, so it was this weird, you know, relationship with his story. And I think what's interesting about LeBron James is his story is, it plays really well, the story of, of the, the, you know, the, the departure and the return home is very heartwarming, but I think he and Akron understand one another uniquely, that this is a place that really needs the validation of people who are from there saying it's a good place to be. So it's not just any random place, it's a place that desperately needed someone like that to say you have value. And I think he really understands that. But it seems it just continues the story of hope. Uh, you, you talk about hope and loss, hope and loss, this yeah. endless cycle of hope and loss and the need to have hope. Um, and then not having it happen yeah. to you. But he, now he's come back, he's just extended the cycle because now they're not doing so well at the moment and he's, all the pressure is on to actually make it work. It's this desperation of identity. Like when you're from a place like Akron, you're entirely self-conscious because you're aware of how you're seen and you're used to being misunderstood. And so you put, so we have a tendency to be desperate. So, so LeBron James leaves and there's this very desperate response to, oh my gosh, we've lost our, you know, our, our, identity, our national identity, and then he comes back and it's like, oh my gosh, we're going to win a championship immediately. You know, it's, it, it, we sort of like, we're not, like I've been in Miami for a couple of days where of course LeBron he was, left, yeah. and then you bring him up and they're like, yeah, it was really nice that he was here, but you know, he left and you know, we still got Miami. You know, and Akron's like, he leaves and everything's gone. He comes back and everything's bad. <laughs> you know, there's no, Why is that? You know. I mean, in the Midwest, we're so proud of the people that are from our hometowns. We tell, of course, you're watching television series, you write about it in the book too. You'll say that guy's from Detroit, some totally obscure character right. that no one in the world would know, but you know he's from your hometown, right. and you want to tell everyone in the room that he's from your hometown, and they don't care. Uh, but we care. We care from our hometown. We care right. to claim everyone uh, from our towns. Why is that? I think it's because, again, this is a generational thing. For for 
30, 40 years, we've been, re we were, previously we were known, we were the rubber capital of the world, and you could go anywhere and say you're from Akron, and people would kind of know what that was. And then you go through the cycle where you're either misunderstood or ignored, and you don't have that easy calling card. And so you, so again, that desperation to like say, well, you know, the Black Keys are from Akron, or you know, LeBron James is from Akron. You, you want to explain yourself mm -hmm. because you know you say Miami, people know what Miami is, mm -hmm. and even Detroit. But I but I think that same. But there's a more is easier there. confidence with those cities. They don't have to claim anything or stand right. up and tell you. You know, yeah. raise their hand. And we're not like that. You know, we're, we're very yeah, we're very self-defining. Exactly. We you know another big element is the people who left. A lot of people leave. I mean, yeah. you talked about brain drain. There's people who've left and and stay away. But there's a, a for the people that have left, at least in my experiences. Their, their passion from afar for the city they left grows. Yeah. Um, doesn't necessarily mean the people that they left is any happier about them leaving, but, right. but those people who are out in LA or, or New York or DC or California, they, you, you watch a game on television, you see Cleveland Indians fans in the stands in yeah. California, like, you know, yeah. rooting them on. Why is that? Tell me more about what you think about the expat community. I, you know, this book came out in March, and I have heard from so many homesick Midwesterners <laughs> who say, you know, I left because I had to, or I left because there was a better opportunity. I wish I could come back. And there's, um, there's this pull of home that's, that's real, and it's real for any place. But I think there is something, you know, about leaving a place that you know is kind of beaten down and still feeling connected there to know. So the pull isn't just the warmth of coming home. The pull is the understanding that you probably kind of needed there, and you're not doing it. So there's this sort of subtle kind of guilt slash resentment you know, on, on either side. So when people come back sometimes um, and say, you know, like, you know, I, I feel your hard times, yeah, and, and I've been there the whole time, I'm like, wait a minute, you know, I stayed through the hard times yeah. and you came back. So there's, and actually it's, it's one part of the book that I've gotten some backlash on from people who, because I think the line in the book is something like, I sometimes resent people who move back and I try to explain what I mean by that, and I think they just see the resentment. Um, but it's, you know, it is. If you stick it out and somebody comes back and then they, they want to reclaim your blues, yeah. like, oh, hey, I played those blues, pal. <laughs> you know, so, exactly. Yeah. I totally understand that. Uh, I, mean, I, I see it certainly in Detroit, a city that's you know, in the middle of their fourth or fifth renaissance. Or, you right. know, I think they had to come up with a new word because renaissance was used back in the 80s, so yeah. now it's a resurgence or whatever they need, yeah. you know, new word. Kind yeah, of thing, legacy you know. cities is the that's one right. that's getting a lot of traction now. Yeah, you mentioned earlier uh, the Black Keys and, and music is a big part of the, of, of when, as I read some of these essays, um, you mentioned music a lot. And music yeah. is one of the identifying factors of a lot of Midwestern cities. Yeah. In, your in your town, uh, you have the Black Keys, you have <coughs> Devo, um, and those are bands you claim. But um, right. tell me about music and its role for you in def defining the character of Akron. Um, well, it's, I mean, personally, like my first understanding of my fallen city um, came through the experience of, of discovering live rock and roll in a, a, a rock club that had overtaken an abandoned bank building in the middle of downtown on Main Street. You know, the, the prevailing culture, this ornate marble and mahogany bank lobby, is now taken over by punk rock. And it's a complete, like, DIY room. And to me, that remains this example of how, in the middle of a decimated downtown, desolate, nothing going on on a Saturday night, there's the first thing that fills that void is art of some sort, creativity. Um, and so that, that metaphor has just com continued to grow and reveal new meaning for me throughout my life. And I think towns like Akron and Detroit really like, they uniquely understand how rock and roll fills that void because there are a lot of empty spaces. There are a lot of, um, you know, we have garages, so we have garage bands. And you don't have garages in Brooklyn. You know, like, you, you don't get to sort of foster and fester uh, without anyone paying attention because you're, you, you're in a glamorous place and people want to see you. So to be anonymous means to be able to kind of grow art in a more advanced way. So like Devo is this whole, was this, you know, 10 year long art concept that finally became, you know, like a best selling pop band. But it was that 10 years of really understanding themselves in, in an ignored city that really made them. Mm -hmm. yeah. The idea of being the rubber capital of the world, when I drive through Akron or near Akron, I still call it the rubber capital right. of the world, even right. though 
I guess it's no longer the rubber capital of the world, technically. I'm, I'm not sure. So what, what happens when you lose your identifying element of your city? You, you keep the iconography. So if you go into the Akron t-shirt shop, everything's got a tire tread or a blimp, you know, because it's still, like, the, the stuff that's interesting about it is still interesting. And Akron still is, you know, home to the world headquarters of Goodyear, and a lot of the intellectual research, the science of rubber, is very much central there. Mm -hmm. So, so the motif is still true, and but kids who never knew what the rubber capital of the world meant walk around with T-shirts with tires on them, so they kind of get it. And I think you need that. It's the idea of the legacy city. Mm -hmm. You build on what you were and what's what your true meaning is, even if it's no longer your central. Um, industry or your central identity, I think it's important. And Detroit the same way. I mean, you know, the idea of automobiles and the idea of that um, factory life is still an important part of what Detroit is trying to become, even if it's not what it will rely on. Right. Last question. Um, where does, uh, in a post-industrial world like Akron and the city that's happening, um, how long do you wait? Where, or are you happy with the direction that the city is kind of making its way towards? The question I've been asked consistently that, that aggravates me this year <laughs> is, is it back? You know, people want to know, like, they want the simple answer, like, is it back? And I think what they mean is, is it back to what it was in 1950? And what's been interesting to me in following my story and following the other stories of these post-industrial cities that are coming through that very difficult generation is not what they were returning to, but how they're evolving. And so, I mean, Detroit's such an interesting example. It's, it's like Paris collapsed in the middle of the Midwest, and instead of saying, well, that's dead, let's <laughs> find a new one, Detroit has to come, come back. So this idea of legacy cities is the idea of it unfolds. And so I think it's not so much like what's the resurgence is what's the grind of evolution. And we understand the grind in, in cities that were built on factory life, there's an understanding you keep, every day you just keep going and going and going. And that's, so I'm interested in how it looks, not as a shiny new thing, but as, as something that has, knows, wears its scars well. Right. Yeah. Well, the book is The Hard Way on Purpose, that's for sure, Essays and Dispatches from the Rust Belt. Yeah. David Giffel, great to meet you. Great Thanks to meet you. Here. Thank yeah. you. Wonderful. All right.